now we're recording. So okay. session two of our class here with uh, Tyler and um, that's, uh, you know, not gonna, not gonna do anything right now. We'll just uh, let Tyler get started so we can, uh, we can get class started. So there you go. Awesome. So uh, welcome everybody back to session two. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me. If not, uh, let me know. Um, I have the I have the podcast uh, thing open if anybody has questions. Um, I will have the chat. I will check the chat every once in a while as well, just to make sure um, if you have any questions, throw them in there or like Brian said, just bring it up. So like I said, welcome back. Uh, in this uh, in this session, we're going to be doing some more reverse engineering, kind of uh, working it off uh, what we did uh, last week. Um, a lot of the stuff we did last week was very much uh, intro to, to reverse engineering, really just making sure that everybody at least had somewhat the uh, same level of assembler, just so that as we move forward, uh, you can, I did, I know that you at least have the um, information uh, available to you. Now, the one thing that I do want to say is if you, um, <clears throat> to me, if you haven't uh, gone out to the uh, the bit.ly site, uh, bit.ly uh, bit slash break dash re, I have uploaded some new things in there. Uh, I haven't uploaded the slides for the session yet. I will do that after the course. Uh, and then I believe Brian will uh, send them out for us as well. But I did upload uh, some of the programs we're going to be looking at uh, this uh, this time. Uh, in addition to that, I did upload some more documents and some more tools that we'll discuss uh, this time. Uh, the, the only thing that I, we won't go into is in the documents directory on the, the, the Google Drive there <clears throat> is a uh, document from Intel about all of the uh, Intel opcodes. Basically, it's just um, think of it as like a, a nice cheat sheet as to what all of the uh, assembler uh, functions uh, do or assembler instructions do. But <clears throat> so in this session, what we're going to do is we didn't get a chance to talk about control structures and loops uh, last time. So we're going to delve into that just a little bit. Uh, some of it will be review, uh, but when we get to the loops, then you'll be able to, that, that should be new uh, material as well. <clears throat> we're also going to talk about how you can use system calls to, uh, to your advantage during uh, reverse engineering. Uh, a lot of times we're going to see the malware or, or any program that we're reverse engineering calling out to different APIs and different DLLs. And we can use that to help us go through and do our analysis. And then finally, we're going to end the night, hopefully talking about malware encryption, how we can detect that and then how we can go in and defeat that. So with that, let me increase this. <clears throat> um, I think I muted myself. No. Okay, sorry. I thought I muted myself. Come on. There we go. All right. So last time we did talk a little bit about control structures and these are the assembler uh, instructions which are going to transfer to control from one location in the program to another. We talked about jump which is a uh, just an absolute jump. Uh, it takes an address uh, somewhere in memory and then it will jump to that. If you've ever seen a uh, program <clears throat> just crash on you where it's, uh, I'm trying to think of the, the right, uh, uh, it used to be a, a lot of segmentation faults that you used to get in Windows, and I'm probably dating myself because this was way back in, you know, before Windows XP, you'd see these a lot more. Typically, what would happen is a, a program would try to jump to an unallocated piece of memory or, or a piece of memory that didn't have instructions at it, and then it would just crash. Um, so that's, you know, typically where you'd see a lot of uh, crashes with jumps, but that's what jumps do. Calls uh, will transfer control to a function located at the address given to it. Uh, it also sets up the stack for to return from the function. And we talked a little bit about the different ways that uh, functions will uh, <clears throat> pass program, or I'm sorry, pass uh, function, or we talked about uh, some of the different ways that uh, when a call is made that the parameters are set up to be pass control to the function, how the EBP and the ESP, the, the base pointer and the stack pointer are set up. 
Uh, in addition to that, how when something returns from a function, how it cleans up the stack. And there are different ways to do that. And that just leads us right into ret, which is just return from a function. The loop instruction, which will uh, basically just jump uh, back to a, uh, another address. And when it does that, it decrements e ECX by one. And if it ever gets to where ECX is uh, less than or equal to zero, then it will just keep going. So this is a very quick way to do a loop. And loop NZ and loop NE are essentially the same thing. <clears throat> Talked about conditional uh, jump instructions. This is the compare, where you compare two different uh, values. Uh, and then after the compare, you're going to have some type of jump. So you'll have a compare, compare two values, and then you'll jump if they're equal, or jump if they're not equal, or jump if they're above or below, and, and so on. And these are used so that you can basically do if statements within a assembler program. And we'll see this as we go through. Um, so I had this exercise. Uh, we, we went through it really quickly. I'm not going to go through it very much because um, I want to get to the new material because there is a lot of really cool things that I want to make sure that we talk about today. Um, but remember when you're going through and you're reversing a function, you kind of go through uh, di different steps. Uh, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to, well, your whole goal is to reverse this function into something that you can understand. And usually that's some type of pseudocode. If you know C programming uh, or C++, a lot of times that's kind of what you go to, or at least that's what I go to. Uh, if you're familiar with another language, you know, you'll, you'll, you'll do it to what you want, uh, what makes sense to you. Uh, but the first step is you want to convert all the assembler to some type of pseudocode. Go through it. We had a, uh, real quick, through. there was a question. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm, kind of I'm kind of interested in that one too. Like the, uh, why is signed jump used? Ah, okay. It's just a question, but I just had three, but I had a similar question. So sorry to cut no. you off. No, no, no. Thank you. Uh, I didn't, for some reason, the, the chat disappeared on me. Um, so the, the question was, why is there a signed jump used? Let me see if I can find it. I just want to make sure that I'm answering the exact question. Come on. Okay. So why is side jump used in exercise three? Oh, okay. Um, so there are two different types of jumps that you can have. Uh, you can have unsigned or signed. Uh, and they're really... There are specific reasons for why you would have a signed versus unsigned jump. In here we have, so we've got a jump less than or equal to right here. Um, and you can see here that jump less than or e equal to is a signed uh, value, meaning that it is going to be, um, the, the numbers are going to be uh, signed integers. Why is it being used here? Um, to be honest with you, Probably because when the code was written, it was the variable uh, here, this uh, whatever local variable that this is pointing to, the EBP plus eight. Because remember anything, I really hope I'm saying this right. Anything plus a, a well, you know what? I'm afraid I'm gonna say something wrong. Let me pull up that slide just. Oops, where'd you go? Sorry about this. Okay. Let's do this. Okay, so if you remember last time when we talked about uh, the base pointer, let me find it. There we go. Um, any, ah, so uh, anything plus uh, the base pointer is a parameter and anything minus the base pointer is a local variable. So what we have here is we have a compare of EBP plus eight, which means that it's a, uh, like we see here, it's a parameter. So it's the first parameter it's being compared to one. So the question again was, why is a signed version of the jump being used as opposed to an unsigned? And chances are the reason that is, is because when the program was compiled, it, the, the first parameter was declared as an integer, uh, not an unsigned integer. And because it was declared as an integer in the compiler, then it can have a value of probably negative six, five, five, three, five, two, 
positive 65535 or, or something like that. It can have both negative and uh, positive values. Uh, so really that's the only reason why. If we had gone in and compiled the program and declared the first parameter as an unsigned int, then we would have seen the uh, unsigned version of the compare being done there. Um, there are other ways or other reasons why you would see a uh, signed version of the jump uh, as opposed to an unsigned or, or vice versa. I believe when you're comparing characters together, you'll often see the unsigned version because characters uh, are essentially integers, but they cannot be negative. Um, but hopefully that uh, answers the, uh, the, the question. Um, and yeah, this particular program probably would not have worked for unsigned integers. So uh, that's something that the program, uh, the programmer did not take into account. Uh, are there any other questions? Okay, I think we're good. All right. Yeah, and if anybody uh, sees a question, please let me know. Uh, I may uh, skip over it. So one of the first things that you're going to do when you go through assembler and you're reverse engineering it is you're going to convert pretty much each line, maybe not every line, uh, but to some type of pseudocode, just so you can get an idea for what's going on. So here at line 401064, where we have the move of EBP plus eight into EAX, that essentially means EAX equals param one. The next line, we're moving EAX into a local variable. Uh, the next line after that is we're comparing the parameter to one. Uh, and if it's uh, less than or equal to uh, one, then it, it jumps down to uh, 401085, which is if you jump back down there, it looks like it's uh, cleaning up the stack uh, and, and moving on. Um, let's see if uh, you guys remember something from last time. Uh, at line 401085, it's moving a local variable into EAX. Uh, you know, somebody either say it or, or put it in chat, why is it moving it into EAX? Right, uh, Alex is right, because uh, EAX uh, at the end of the function call, EAX is typically used uh, to hold the return value in a 32-bit uh, program. 64-bit works a little bit differently, and I kind of did uh, some more research on some 64-bit stuff uh, over the week, and I think we'll uh, probably the last session is we'll probably have a section dedicated to just 64 bit to talk about the differences between 32 bit and 64 bit. Um, so um, just uh, know for now that uh, 64 bit does work a little bit differently, but for at least 32 bit code, uh, EAX is where the return value is typically kept in. Okay, so you go. Like I said, the first step is you go through and you convert uh, as much as you can to pseudocode, uh, and then you start combining the instructions and reducing them where possible. You can see that the first three lines here that we've marked up, uh, where EAX equals param one, uh, uh, local var one become looks at EAX and we do the compare, we can kind of convert that down to a couple less lines, where we're essentially we're saying local var one equals param one, and then we're doing the compare. And we just keep doing that, uh, and we start assigning meaningful names based off of what we think that the uh, the assembler is. Uh, it looks like we have a counter and a total here, uh, and we just keep going through and we keep combining and assigning meaningful names until we get down uh, and can't go any farther. And typically by then you have a good idea of, of what the function is. And in this case, we have a factorial function. Okay, so. Before we go on, on and we'll start some of the new material, does anybody have any questions? Mm, I'm good. All right, cool. <clears throat> so let's continue on. So loops. Loops are obviously a big part of programming. And so you're going to start seeing, you'll, you'll, when you start doing uh, reverse engineering, you're going to see a lot of loops. But fortunately, uh, loops tend to have a very unique structure when you're looking at the code and when you're looking at the code visually. And so they're very easy to, to point out and even determine what type of loop you're dealing with. Um, so loops, when you kind of deconstruct them, have uh, a couple sections that are, are always in 
most every loop. So here we have a very simple while loop in kind of a pseudocode. Uh, we have the initialization, initialization for the iterator. Uh, I is the iterator in this case. Uh, we're initializing it to uh, zero. We have the check condition. This is what we uh, check to see if it's true so that we can exit the loop. In this case, uh, this is I is less than zero. So while I is less than zero, or I'm sorry, while I is less than 100, we're gonna keep going through the loop. Then we have the body of the loop. This is everything that's done within the loop itself. And then we have a loop, loop increment, or at least a modification of the iterator within the loop. It could be an increment, it could be a decrement, it could be any number of things. And so each of these four things you're going to see in the assembler in some section. Uh, and so we'll go through uh, two common loops. Uh, we'll go through a while loop and a for loop and show you what it looks like in both um, assembler and in, in the uh, code itself. So here we have a while loop. Uh, the, the loop that we're dealing with here is uh, on the bottom, in the bottom right corner. It's basically just a very simple while loop that goes through uh, five times. It goes, uh, it starts with int at zero, uh, then it goes through and increments uh, i by one and printing out while loop uh, as it goes through. And you can see in the assembler right here where all those pieces are. We have uh, the initialization, uh, up here uh, where it's moving zero into var four. Now, one thing I wanted to point out is you see here where it says EBP plus var four. The EBP uh, plus var four is just a way that Ida Pro uh, will modify things. Instead of seeing EBP plus eight, it, uh, Ida Pro automatically knows that we're dealing with a local variable. And so it uh, goes in and modifies that just to say that it's a var four. Uh, just to make things a little bit easier for you. But here we have the initialization at the very top of the iterator. We go down a little bit, we see the compare of var4 against the value of 5 and then jumping if it's greater than. In other words, it's going to be going until we see that uh, the iterator, or var4 in this case, is uh, greater than 5. Or in other words, it's going to go through the loop body and uh, while it's less than or equal to five. Then in the green section here, we have the loop body itself. Uh, the second line from the bottom of there where we have add EA, oh, I'm sorry, we have move uh, var four into EAX, add one to EAX, and then move EAX back into var four. This is the increment for the iterator. And then at the very bottom, we have the jump back to the condition check all the way at the very top again. And this is just what a uh, while loop will look like in assembler. Now, if we visualize this, you can see that it looks a little bit differently and you can, you can kind of uh, imagine it a little bit easier to mark it up. Um, so up here on top, we have the, um, the initialization of the iterator, the uh, move zero into var four. Then we have the little arrow here uh, where we have the compare uh, and then the jump. Uh, with Ida Pro, anytime you see a green arrow, that means that that jump succeeded. Uh, otherwise, the red arrow means that that jump did not occur. Uh, so in this case, uh, when we have a jump greater than five, we can see that it goes down to this code down here. And you should recognize this code as something that cleans up the stack. You have the move of the EBP into ESP, popping EBP off, and then the return. So that's where we exit our loop. But if we don't take this jump, uh, we go down here to the, the loop body. And then at the very end of the loop body, we have this jump, uh, uh, this unconditional jump down here, which takes us all the way back to the compare again. So this is what a while loop will look like. It's, it's very succinct, it's very uh, short. Um, the body itself may look um, a little bit differently. It may have a bunch of stuff in it, but you'll have this very basic, um, format that you see here. Let me make sure this. And again, I apologize if somebody's putting chat in there. Um, doesn't let me see it very easily. So that was while loops. So let's talk about for loops. For loops um, are very similar to while loops, except they typically have their uh, increment counter section as separate. So in the lower right corner, again, we have a very simple for loop doing the same thing. It's just going from 
uh, one to, or some from zero to five, uh, incrementing by one each time. Um, at the very top, we have the initialization uh, counter uh, and then a jump to the condition check right away. Uh, you can see that it jumps all the way down here to uh, the compare. Uh, and then if that's, uh, if it's greater than, then it will uh, exit the loop. Otherwise, it does the loop body here in the purple, um, where it uh, calls printf to print out the for loop. Uh, it adds four to the ESP. Um, I'm gonna be honest with you, it's a little weird. I'm not sure off the top of my head why it's doing that, but it's probably to clean up the stack from printf. Uh, and then it jumps up to uh, the increment counter right up here, where it moves uh, var four into EAX, move uh, adds one to EAX and then moves EAX back into var four. So very similar to the while loop, uh, just it has the, uh, the uh, increment counter section just a little bit set up a little bit differently. But if we look at it visually, we can see that uh, we still have everything there. Uh, just the, the places of the code look a little bit differently. If I would compare the two, so here's uh, the, the for graph, uh, here's the while graph, you can see just how they look a little bit differently. And if you would go through and you would kind of map this out, you, you would probably get a feeling for, for what it was. The big thing to keep in mind is though, uh, when you're looking at assembler uh, and you think you have a, a loop, some type of loop, look to see uh, if you can visually it, that it is actually looping around. Like here we see uh, the, uh, the flow of the code go from the very uh, initialization of the function down to the compare, uh, into the body uh, right here in the middle, down to the uh, increment of the iterator, and then all the way back up again. Uh, and you'll see that flow go, going around. And seeing it visually uh, absolutely um, helps a lot. <clears throat> so in the, uh, in the, uh, the Google Drive uh, for, the, for the course, I have a little program called loops.exe, which has two loops in this. Um, in fact, they're probably these exact same loops that we just looked at, uh, both a for loop and a while loop, uh, so that you can go in and you can go uh, look and see on your own or with uh, the different tools that you have, what these loop loops look like. So outside of loops, you'll typically also run into things like uh, case statements. Um, case statements or, or switch statements, uh, especially within like C code, these are a way to have uh, a number of different um, cases that you can go in and uh, base, uh, do one test uh, on uh, and jump to different places. It's, if you've never used them before, think of them as a very big if then statement. So here we have the variable test up on top. Uh, this is the test expression. We have the test cases. Uh, here, case, uh, it's testing to see if the test variable is one. If it is, then it pr uh, prints out one and then breaks out of the, the switch statement. If it's zero, it prints zero and then breaks out of the case statement, um, which is the, the code part. And then finally, we have the default case. Uh, the, the, the default case is basically if none of the other test cases match, then do the default. And you'll actually come across this a lot uh, when you're doing uh, analysis, uh, especially on uh, remote access Trojans, which uh, take in uh, some type of um, command and control commands. Uh, oftentimes, the commands are set up within a switch uh, statement so that it brings in the command that it receives from the server. It has this huge uh, case statement that it goes through to decide what to do based off of that. So this is uh, essentially what the switch statement looks like in the graph today. So up here at the very top, we have the test expression. Uh, here we're, we're moving the first argument into EAX, then we move it into local uh, variable var four, we compare var four to zero. Uh, and if it's not equal to zero, um, then we move down here to do another compare where the compare is one. If it is equal to zero, because we have the jump zero statement, it jumps all the way down here to the bottom right block where it prints off a zero. Uh, we have the test cases. The test cases will just be a number of different compares that will kind of go through in a uh, some type of, of tree format. If in this particular case, excuse me, in this particular case, we only had two different cases. This is uh, the, the code we had here. We had uh, 
case for the value of one and case for the value of zero. So we only have two test cases in this code. If you had some code that had a lot more test cases, you'd see just this huge tree of a lot of different compares. But then you have the, the different code that they go through depending on what the case is. And then finally, we have the default case, which if nothing, uh, if nothing else matches, then it kind of jumps down into this and, and goes forward. So that's really what we were going to talk about with uh, loops and, and case statements. Um, we're, going to, we're definitely going to see that a lot more uh, today. Uh, as we start actually looking at some code. Um, but before I go on, I kind of want to make sure that everybody uh, is on the same page. Nobody has any questions. I kind of wish that there was like a, um, some type of uh, way that everybody could just, you know, like mark a flag that they didn't have any questions. But unfortunately, I don't see anything like that in this. Um, but I'm not seeing anybody raise any questions, so I think we're good. So we will go on. All right. So now we're kind of out of the basics of looking at assembler and looking at the basic structures within programming. And we're going to get start getting more into the actual, uh, what most people consider reverse engineering. And uh, because of that, we're, we're going to get start using, uh, doing some more hands-on uh, with, with some code. So. I want to talk about system calls. And when I say system calls, what I mean is uh, any type of call that's being, uh, any type of function or API that's being called from a DLL or some other type of library on the system, not contained within the program itself. And if you think about it, a lot of programs have uh, <clears throat> DLLs that they import and functions that they import from those DLLs because it doesn't make sense for a program to write all of its code and just make it completely self-sustained uh, because the, the program then becomes very large and it becomes very cumbersome to, to transfer around. But because a lot of programs uh, call out to different APIs and DLLs, we can look at those system calls in a function and kind of get hints for what their purpose is. Um, specifically, what I mean by this is when you start looking at some code uh, in something like Ida Pro, um, start looking for some interesting system calls uh, and they'll give you an idea of what the purpose of that function is. So if you start going through a function and you see that it's calling out the write file or, uh, or fwrite, uh, another uh, version of uh, write file or another way to, to write out to a file, you know that that function is going to be uh, writing out to a file. If you see that it's calling load resource, then you know it's doing something with the resources attached to the program. Uh, if you see reg set value, that means it's writing to the registry. That could be where it sets its persistence. Any networking APIs that you see are, are always going to be interesting because that means that's where the, the, uh, the program that you're looking at is going to be communicating out over the network. And if you're looking for things like command and control servers or ports that they're communicating on, this is where you're going to find that information. Another uh, set of interesting system calls to look for are crypt e crypt encrypt or crypt decrypt. These are the functions that are contained within the Microsoft libraries to encrypt and decrypt data. And a lot of malware, including ransomware, use crypt encrypt and crypt decrypt in order to encrypt their files uh, or encrypt the files that they're, they're encrypting. And so if you wanna start uh, looking at ransomware, then you, this is what you'll really start looking for and start focusing in on these particular system calls and seeing how they're encrypting the file. You know, what key are they using? How do they generate the key? And just start kind of backtracing from there. Now, one of the, did I skip some slides? No. Um, so one of, uh, one thing to do is when you start looking at a function, um, you know, we went through, let me back up here a little bit. We went through this example and you know, we went through and we basically did a complete reverse engineering of this uh, particular function. When you're doing reverse engineering and you're actually going in and you, you have a large function uh, or a large program to reverse, you're not gonna be doing this uh, from start to, to finish because you're just not gonna have time. Uh, a lot of uh, programs, especially since we're talking about malware, a lot of malware will have a lot of different functions, some of which do nothing, some of some of which could even be throwaway code to kind of get you to uh, waste your time analyzing things that don't get called or, or don't do anything. Um, so you want to focus in on the interesting system calls that you want to find. And then 
when you find those interesting system calls, rename the function they're in to be related to that so you know where to jump back to. So for example, let's say I find a function that's called write file. Uh, or I'm sorry, let's say I find a function that's calling write file. Uh, I know that that function is going to be writing something out to a file, and so I may want to look at that later. So I'll rename the function as uh, file underscore writing out or, or something like that, just so that I know that uh, when I look at the name of that function or anywhere else that that function is called, I'll know that it's writing out to a file. Um, there are a couple of plugins that will do this for you. Uh, the best one that I know for IDA Pro is called IDA Scope. Um, it will go through and it will automatically uh, rename a lot of these functions for you based off of the interesting system calls that are in there. So in other words, if it sees uh, file-based APIs or registry-based APIs within that function, it'll automatically rename those for you. So you can, uh, so you can very quickly jump in to the, very, uh, to the things that are uh, probably interesting to you. Um, unfortunately, IDAScope does not work with the free version of IDA Pro. So you're gonna to have to get the commercial version to work with it. Uh, the only reason it doesn't work is because that the free version is at uh, version 5.0, and I believe IDAScope needs uh, version 6 point something uh, in order to work. Um, but, uh, you know, with this, you know, how do you figure out uh, what system calls are being uh, loaded into a program within IDA Pro? Um, so let me, uh, let me just go ahead and, and do this and, and show you guys. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to load, no, I'm not going to load that one. Um, I'm going to load, uh, we're going to look at this one, uh, this program later, this uh, program called antivirus.exe. Um, I'm just loading it into IDA Pro just so we can see how to find the functions that it's loading. Um, the one thing that I'm going to say, um, and I'll say this multiple times throughout uh, tonight, the programs that we're looking at tonight um, are malware. So we are starting to, de to deal with malware now. So you wanna make sure that you're protected, that you're definitely analyzing these in a virtual machine, and that uh, if you have something like Windows Defender turned on, that you, uh, that you turn it off because Windows Defender and other antivirus will detect and, and capture these. So if you want to follow along, all of these programs are in the Google Drive, the, the bit.ly slash break dash RE. Uh, so you can go in and see that if you want. But here we have uh, IDA Pro. Uh, I'm, again, I'm using the free version of IDA Pro. Uh, if we want to see what uh, functions the, uh, the program uh, imports, all you have to do is go up to the imports uh, window right here um, and click on it. Or if you go up to view, open subviews and then imports, uh, it will bring up a window. And these are all the different imports that this particular function or program uh, loads from all the different libraries. So we can uh, start scanning through this and, and you know, uh, kind of get an idea for what it's doing. So here we have a bunch of registry APIs. So we know that it's gonna be interacting with the registry. We see reg set value. Uh, we know because it's loading that, we know that it's going to be uh, modifying the registry. Um, and if you didn't know what these APIs are, just Google them. You're, you're going to find some resource that, that tells you exactly what they are. <clears throat> so here's reg set value. So let's say I wanted to see everywhere that uh, this particular program called reg set value to see, um, you know, to start digging down into it a little bit more. The best way to do that is find the function that you want to look at in the imports window. Uh, here we have reg set value selected, and I'm just going to double click on it. And it takes me to uh, the import address table within the program itself. Uh, and then I'm going to just uh, click on it once, uh, select it, and then I'm going to press X. And this pulls up all the different cross references to that particular function. Or I could right click on it and just go jump to crossref to operand. And this shows me every place within the program that the uh, that reg set value is called. And I can start going into each of these and seeing what they do. So I'll just uh, make sure the first one's selected, click OK. And now I'm in this function where we can see where reg set value is, ca is called. Now, the, the, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the reasons that I really like using um, IDA Pro is that if it knows about the API and it knows a, a lot about a lot of APIs, it will automatically label all of the different uh, 
um, function parameters that are passed to that function. So here we have right set value exa. So if we didn't know what it did, we'd have to go out to MSDN, look up what it did, look at all the different parameters, figure out what they are and so on. But here, IDAPRO is nice enough to not only comment every line where those parameters are put on there, it also rena automatically renames the variables for us, which is great. So here we have right set value, uh, the first uh, parameter, remember parameters are passed in reversed order. So the, the, the first parameter of the function is the last one that's pushed. Just uh, another, another question real quick, if that's all right. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, was it, it, was in the, it was in the chat, they were asking about the pass CLI. Ah, so um, pass CLI is not malware. Um, I don't know if it will be detected as such, but um, but I wrote it, so it's it's not malware. I hope. And then the um, if someone wanted to follow along and look at antivirus.exe, that they, should uh, so antivirus should be if you go up to bit.ly slash break dash re. Mm -hmm. Go to class two and then exercises should be this. Yeah, it's in there. Uh, the uh, CQ uh, underscore exercise one dot zip, uh, it'll be in there. The pa is password protected. The password is infected, all lowercase. That was my question, actually. So thanks for answering that, too. Yeah, absolutely. OK, let me make sure. Uh, okay. All right. So let's continue on. Um, so here again, we have reg set value. Uh, Ida Pro nicely names all of the functions for us. Um, you can even hover over it. You can even hover over it and it will show you uh, all of the different functions as, as well. Um, so what are the other things that you can do if you didn't realize you can do this in Ida Pro? And again, I love Ida Pro. I know some people are very much into Binary Ninja. I just haven't had the opportunity to use it uh, yet or the, the, the opportunities that I've had it has been very limited. P some people like were there. Um, so there are a lot of different uh, disassemblers out there. This is just the one that I, I prefer um, because it can do a lot. It's been around for a long time. So there are a lot of things that, that it can definitely do. One of the best things about it is um, because it knows so much about things, um, it knows ab about a lot of the different, um, how does it call it, uh, symbolic constants that are passed to programs. So if we look at this function here, reg create key x, all right, so the first uh, value up here is the h key, the, the hive. Um, and this constant here represents a hive, a specific hive. If you didn't know what you know, 8002 in hex meant, um, you'd have to go out and look it up. Um, however, Ida Pro is nice enough that if we, write, if we select the constant, right click on it, and then go to use standard symbolic constant, it will show you everything that it knows for that particular value to be. And then we go in and look for the one that uh, makes the most sense. In this particular case, it's probably H key local machine that would make sense based off of the fact that we're calling a registry key uh, function. Uh, and then we just select it, click OK, and it will automatically put that for us so that when we come back in later on, it will uh, uh, still be there and we'll know what it means. Um, some of the later versions of Ida Pro can even or a number of constants together. So if you have, uh, so for example, I'm trying to think where you would see this. Um, when you're opening up a file, when you're asking for the different uh, parameters, the, the security permissions for that file, you may uh, or together the constants uh, open and write. Uh, earlier versions, like the free version of IDA, do not do very well at figuring out what that one is. Uh, some of the later versions do a lot better. Uh, but here we also have the SAM desired. We can go down to use standard symbolic constant. And hey, guess what? We find out that it's in this particular case with the reg key value, uh, it's going to it's asking to be able to write to that uh, to H key local machine. So just by using uh, Ida Pro, we are able to figure this out. Um, so in this particular function, we have uh, reg create key, we have reg set value, and then it closes the key. 
Um, so this is this particular function is doing a lot with uh, with registry values. So what I'm going to do, um, even though I'm not uh, reversing any more of it, I'm just going to rename this. And you can rename any variable or any address in Ida Pro by selecting it and then pressing N uh, as in Nancy or just right click and go to rename. And then I'm just gonna call it reg. Uh, the way that I do it is I'll put the type in all uppercase, so reg underscore underscore, and then I don't know what else this is doing, so I'll just call it right reg. Um, and then just leave it like that. And now I've renamed this function so that if I see it uh, anywhere else in this uh, program, I know that this uh, particular program or this particular function is at least writing to the registry. And you can go and start, uh, you know, iterative, iteratively going and jumping down even farther. So if I wanted to say, see everywhere that this is called, I can right click on this, go down to, uh, jump to crossref, and now I see three locations where this particular function is called. So we know that at least in three different places within the program, it writes out to the registry. Um, one other thing that I uh, want to give you guys a tip for, um, you'll notice here that you don't see addresses listed out. Um, some people prefer not to see the addresses. I prefer to see them. Um, if you go up to the options menu and then to general, you can uh, select function offsets. Oh, I'm sorry, no, I'm sorry, no. Uh, you can select line prefixes uh, over here uh, and then click okay and then it shows you uh, those addresses in the code. Uh, some people like to see that, some people don't. Uh, it's totally up to you. Um, trying to think of any more IDA tips because somebody did ask uh, about ways to, to um, you know, use the tools a little bit more. Um, the only other thing that I'll say is uh, by default, I believe it shows it in the graphical view uh, in Ida Pro. And honestly, that's the view that I prefer just because it's a lot easier. Uh, over here on the left-hand side, you have this graph overview that you can kind of select and you can get a really good idea for um, the flow of the code. Here we can see that there's a loop. Um, we see an XOR there. So, hey, it's probably doing some type of XOR loop, uh, some XOR encoding or decoding. Um, if you don't like this, and some people don't, uh, if you don't like the graphical view, just hit the space bar and it'll convert it over to just a normal um, straight uh, lines of assembler. Uh, to get back, you just hit the space bar again and you jump back. So that's Ida Pro. Um, I also wanna show you how to figure out this information uh, within uh, X, uh, X64 debug or X32 debug. So I'm gonna open up the same one, uh, same program in X32 debug. You can see, you know, it looks a little bit differently. Um, so, you know, how do you figure out what uh, what APIs are being loaded in by the program uh, from within X64 debug? Uh, it's a little bit differently. You just load up the program in the debugger. You click on the symbols tab here, and the symbols tab will show you every single DLL and uh, module file that's loaded in there, uh, loaded up by the program. Uh, click on the module for the program itself. So in this case, antivirus.exe. And here it shows us all of the different uh, imports that are being uh, loaded. Uh, I don't believe, I, I could be wrong here. Let's see here. Um, yeah, unfortunately, I, you cannot um, kind of jump to everywhere this is called, to my knowledge. Um, here, this is just the, uh, the import address table. Um, I'm gonna have to fool around with this. I don't, I don't think you can. Um, oh wait, here you go. Find references to selected address. And I must have done it wrong. But it looks like there might be a way. Okay. Let me close this down. But that was a, a quick uh, little tutorial on that on Ida Pro and um, X64 debug on finding that information. If you recommend some good Ida tutorials or analysis examples at some point, I absolutely will. Um, so the question was if I can recommend some good Ida tutorials, I will absolutely find some. The one thing that I'll say, let me see if I can find it. If, if you can get this book, the Ida Pro book, um, 
This is from No Starch Press. This is actually the first edition. They've already come out with the second edition. Um, I highly recommend that, especially if you're going to be using Ida Pro. The Ida Pro book by Chris Eagle. Chris Eagle has probably forgotten more about Ida Pro than anybody has ever known. Um, but it has a just a huge amount of information on not only how to use Ida Pro, but also how to reverse engineer code itself. So it's a, I highly recommend it. And you can usually get it pretty cheap through hum, Humble Bundle or something like that. Yeah, somebody just talked about Humble Bundle. All right. Um, oh, it does need to be the physical book. Uh, is that, Jay, is that because it's just so big it's easier to use it the, as the physical book? So his answer was, yep, for a different way too hard an ebook. And, and I can understand that. Um, it is a thick book. Um, the first edition is 600 pages. I can't imagine that the second edition is any smaller. So um, yeah, I definitely recommend it. And plus, um, I'll, I'll admit, um, No Starch Press is uh, a lot of, uh, has a lot of uh, great books in there. So uh, definitely um, look at look at getting it. Um, another question, so is Ida Pro, uh, so Ida Pro is only the paid version. Um, is Pro the only version to get? So Ida Pro is the name of the program. There are different levels that you can buy of Ida Pro. I believe there's just the, I don't know what they call it. They may, they may actually call it the basic level, but then there's also the advanced level. If you're not going to be doing anything with weird uh, CPUs uh, or doing any mobile malware analysis, then you only need the basic version. Um, otherwise, you need to get uh, the advanced version, um, which will support a lot more processors. Um, and yes, it is very expensive. Um, this is not something that you will probably expect uh, to buy on your own. Um, uh, I think uh, somebody uh, wrote that it's 1400 uh, to, uh, on up. Um, if you buy the decompiler that adds another couple of thousand plus support onto it. So you're probably looking at uh, a couple thousand dollars. Uh, and again, that's why people are looking at Redair and Binary Ninja and so on. Um, the one thing that I'll say too is because it's so expensive that people will often get tempted to pirate it. Do not pirate Ida Pro because if they find out, and they typically will find out uh, that you're pirating it, you get, uh, you get banned for life. Uh, you will never be allowed to purchase it. Or if they find out that your company has purchased it for you, then they will remove the license from your company. So again, it's not a uh, good thing to do anyways. But anyways, so, so let's, uh, let's move on. <clears throat> All right. All right, so talked about how to find interesting imports in Ida Pro. Uh, same thing in the slide. Uh, just go in and do that. You know, look for uh, different system calls that uh, you think you'll want to look at. So, you know, look where something's writing to the registry. So that will tell you persistence. Look where it's writing to files or to, to the file system. That will tell you what it's modifying on the file system. Uh, look for any of the networking calls and see what it's sending out. Look for the encryption calls and so on. Um, another thing you could do is break on interesting functions. Um, so when we start actually running the malware, we may get to a point where, you know, we, we're not sure what the malware is doing, but we want it to, uh, we want it to stop running when it hits a particularly in interesting function. So uh, in this case, reg set value, let's say we had the malware, uh, we knew it was writing to the registry, but it was doing some really weird encryption for what it was writing to the registry, and we really didn't feel like trying to break that. What we can do is we can go in uh, in our debugger and set a breakpoint on that function itself, and then it will stop running when it hits that function. Uh, so the way that you do this in x64 debug or x32 debug is uh, very similar to what we just saw. You select the symbols, uh, select your program name so you can see the imports, you find the interesting API that you want to, uh, to break on, you right click on it and then you just click on toggle breakpoint or you just hit F2. And then when you run the program, whenever in this particular case, reg set value is called, then it will uh, stop uh, running at that point or hopefully it will stop running at that point. This is a great thing to do if you have some very obfuscated uh, macro code within a Word document or Excel document. 
what you do is you load up uh, Word or Office uh, into your um, into your debugger, and then you set a breakpoint on something like write file or process execute, uh, and then or both, and then load the document and allow it to run the macro. And in theory, what should happen is the Office document will run; it will run the macro until it gets to a point where it's writing out to the file system or executing code. Uh, such as PowerShell code, uh, and then it will the debugger will stop at that point, and you can see what it's trying to write to or what it's trying to run. Uh, a very quick way to go in and see how to, what a particular uh, obfuscated code or, or macro is doing. Okay, so we kind of went through that um, pretty quickly, but you know, based off of everything that we just uh, talked about, you can go in and do a lot already. So let's do a, a really quick exercise um, with antivirus.exe. Um, this is a program that contains multiple resources that it's going to write out to disk. Uh, and so using what we just uh, talked about, uh, figure out what the file name that the resource XML is being written to, what the file name that the resource DLL is being written to. Uh, when I say resource XML and resource DLL, those are the actual names of the resources. That this particular malware wasn't too creative in hiding what it was doing. Uh, and finally, see if you can figure out the name of the mutex that is set by, uh, by the malware. Um, it is uh, 8.53. Um, let's give everybody, I don't know, let's say uh, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, uh, and then uh, we'll kind of pick up again. Uh, and we'll go through uh, this exercise and see if everybody was able to do it. Uh, but I will be sitting here answering questions if anybody has it. Um, and we'll just kind of go from there. So Jerry, you were saying that uh, about Hopper. Um, I really like Hopper, uh, especially for uh, anal re uh, reversing um, uh, Mac programs. Uh, it, it's, it's it's super cheap too. I, if I remember right, Hopper is like a hundred bucks or something like that, and comes with its own uh, decompiler as well, which is nice. Uh, the password um, uh, should be infected. Oops. Uh, the the uh, the password uh, for uh, the standard password for malware within um, password protected archives should always be infected. That's kind of the standard that the industry uses. But while everybody is working on this, I am going to excuse myself for one minute, and then I will be back. Um,
Uh, so, uh, Kaylin asked, um, how will we be able to break encryptions like AES in case they are used? Um, we'll actually talk about that in the next section. Uh, we're not going to get particularly too deeply into things like AES. Um, we're going to focus more on some more simpler encryptions, but I, I will definitely talk about how we can do that. Unfortunately, I was not able to find a good example that used that. Uh, I will try to find one for next week. How often are simple encryptions used in real life? More, uh, more often than you might think. Um, so after uh, we're done with this, um, I will show an example. Uh, I don't want it to be recorded, uh, but I will show an example of um, some simple encryption that was used in an APT level software. Um, that, that is uh, pretty cool to, to see. So um, it's nine o'clock, let's go, or at least nine o'clock Eastern, sorry. I keep forgetting that everybody's on different time zones. Uh, we'll go about another five minutes uh, and then we'll, we'll start back up and kind of go over these. I know I'm not given a lot of time. Um, just because we have a, such a short time, I wanna make sure we get through everything. And we have another exercise, I think, at some point. Yes, we do. But those of you seeing me pull up my Steam account, I am actually looking for something related to this. But I don't see it. Jay, are you using the free version of IDA? Um, he doesn't so, have audio, so he may just be slow typing. OK, that's fine. Oh, 6.0. So that's the, that's not the free version. That would be the, um, the free version is 5.0. Um, you probably have the trial version, which is absolutely fine. Um, so, uh, it probably, here, let me close out of this. 
So I've had that happen as well, uh, where everything's kind of shoved together. So I assume what you mean is to do, um, where the windows right here are like really small and kind of hard to, to get into. Um, I was having that issue as well. Um, and so what I ended up having to do in my VM is put it into full screen mode um, and then kind of expand everything out. Uh, you should be able to resize the windows uh, once you do that. Um, if that's not it, then I'm not entirely sure. It could be something weird that's going on with VMware. That's better. All right, about one more minute. Okay, so we've uh, been going a little bit over 10 minutes um, or, or so uh, on this, maybe a little bit longer than that. Uh, I know it wasn't a lot of time, but hopefully you were able to at least get through one of the questions. Um, but let's start going over them uh, just so that we can start jumping into some of the uh, some of the cool things that, that we're going to be looking at. Um, so in this exercise, uh, we wanted to get uh, answer these three questions as what the file name that the resource XML is written to, what the file name the resource DLL is written to, and what the name of the mutex, or what, what the name of the mutex uh, that's set is. Um, so I'm going to do this in Ida Pro. Let me make sure that I have the chat pulled up so because I'm going to have you guys answer some things. Give me one second, please. Oops, wrong thing. There we go. Hopefully you all can see this. Uh, let me minimize some things. Okay. All right, so the first thing we want to know is what file name is the resource uh, called XML written to? So based on that, um, what did everybody uh, search for? What, so what, um, what uh, API should I search for to, to start figuring this out? Uh, somebody go ahead and, and write it in chat or, or just kind of call it out. So these are all of the uh, different uh, functions that are, that are loaded by antivirus. Um, anybody? Okay, so I'm assuming that somebody got it. Um, hopefully hopefully uh, somebody did, so I'll, I'll start going through it. Uh, F open, okay. So uh, one of the things that we could look for is, is F open. Um, I'm just gonna sort this alphabetically just so I can find it easier. 
Um, and here we have F open down here. If you didn't know what F open was, um, you could go ahead and uh, look it up. Um, Google it. Uh, F open is the uh, function that's used within C code to open up a file. So here is the function. Um, I'm going to select it, press X and see everywhere that it's, uh, it's called. And it's only called in two different places within the program, which is good. So that means that we don't have to go through a lot of different places. So let's just start with the first one. So here we have F open. Um, and that we can see that it's uh, opening it up with the permissions of uh, write and binary. So we know that it's writing to a file. And in fact, if we go down a little bit farther down here, we see F write. So we know that in this particular function, the, uh, the malware is writing to a file. And, but we don't know what it's writing. Um, if we start moving up, we can see uh, some loop right here. Um, and we'll talk about this uh, next. We can see that it's, uh, this is probably a decryption loop or an encryption loop because we have an XOR right here with two different values. And I'm just gonna start going up. Uh, here we have something interesting. Um, and, and you'll do this. As you start going through and reverse engineering a program, you'll, you'll start kind of looking at the function and kind of getting ideas or, or getting notions for what it's doing in your mind. Um, but here you see uh, it's moving um, the byte F, F, uh, 4D and then 5A, uh, and you can tell that they're, they're moving into um, places that are right next to each other because it's moving 4D into wherever ESI is pointing, and then it's moving 5A into wherever ESI plus one is pointing, so right next to the byte right next to that. Um, so, you know, it's moving 4D 5A. Does anybody know what 4D 5A uh, uh, stands for? Somebody should know this. Um, if you, if, right, MZ, exactly, uh, MZ. Uh, MZ is, are the first two bytes of a uh, Windows program. Um, if you didn't know what 4D stood for, uh, in IDA Pro, you can right click on it and then you can change it to, some, uh, to a different uh, version of it. You can change it to uh, a different uh, number value or in this case, I'm going to change it to its ASCII equivalent. So here we can see that it's moving MZ over. So it looks like it's going to be writing in this particular function, it's writing out some type of executable. And so I'm just gonna keep going up. Uh, here we have size of resource being called. So that's good. That means we are dealing with a resource. Lock resource, load resource. And finally up here we have find resource and we can see that it's searching for the resource DLL. So uh, in this particular case, uh, we did find the function where it's writing out uh, DLL um, uh, to some type of file. And so because of that, we want to, uh, uh, the question was asking, you know, what was the file name that it was writing it out to? So let's go down here and see if we can find it. So here we have F open, um, arg zero in this case. Uh, so here we have F open, we can highlight over, over it. Um, if you didn't know what uh, the function for F open uh, is actually let's just go ahead and google that so i don't know what f open is or what parameters are passed to it so i just google it and here we have the first parameter is a file name and the second is a mode and we saw that the mode being passed to it is is w so that means write uh, and then uh, actually we saw wb and here it says the additional b character uh, makes it for a uh, binary mode or a binary file but that means that the first argument here um, is what the name of the file is going to be. So unfortunately in this function, uh, the name of the file is actually being passed into it uh, as the first argument. So um, the best way that we could figure out what that is, is we can go to the top of the function. Um, we can click on uh, this, uh, the name of the function, and I'm just gonna press X. And it's gonna show us everywhere where that function is being called. Uh, and so I'm just gonna go to the first one. And here we see um, EAX is where the, and we, we're just gonna start tracing up until we find the name of the file. Uh, so the first uh, argument, or actually the only argument passed to this function is EAX. Um, so we go up to the line before that, we see that var 64 is passed into EAX. So let's start looking to see where var 64 is. And here we see another um, 
And here we see that var64 is loaded into EAX. Then we see this uh, cimm.dll is being uh, pushed onto the stack. And then EAX, our variable, is being pushed onto the stack. And then stringcat is being called. And if you don't know what stringcat is, stringcat, uh, strcat is basically concatenates two different, var two different strings together. So we're going to be concatenating whatever EAX is, uh, our var64, uh, and cimm.dll. Um, and so, in this case, we know now that our DLL file is going to be written out as a file named cimm.dll. So, does that make sense? Does anybody have any, uh, about how we, we got to that? Does that, anybody have any questions? About how I, I went from the one function. Uh, all right. So just a quick recap. So here we have, um, I'm just going to call, actually, I'm going to rename it. So here we have this function that we know that we're going to be writing the DLL resource out. So I'm going to call it res underscore underscore write DLL resource. Uh, so you, you may see this uh, warning message a lot of times with Ida Pro where it says that you're trying to rename a function into uh, a name that exceeds the current length limit. Do you want to increase the limit? Just say yes. It's not a big deal. Um, but we have this function here um, that we know uh, is loading up the DLL resource. We can see that with the find resource call and it's uh, pushing the name DLL. Uh, and then all I'm doing is I'm looking at the function calls. And we see it call fopen. And this is how we found that function to begin with is we look for fopen. And then we see f right. Um, so we know that um, the DLL resource is being loaded up. Something's being done to it because we're seeing this uh, this loop here, this uh, uh, decryption loop, and then it's being written out. Um, now, as you saw, we didn't actually go through and reverse every single thing in here, um, but we just went through and did a general uh, analysis to figure out, you know, just kind of get what this was. And then I went in and I just renamed this. And remember, our goal was to find the name of the file. And this function didn't actually give the name of the file. But what we found was uh, with the f, uh, the where is it? The f open command. The the first parameter being passed to it is the name of the file to be opened. And in this case, it was uh, uh, set to be arg zero, which means that it was passed into this function. So in order for us to figure out what the name of that file is, we have to go see what's being passed into this function. And so to do that, I'm just gonna select the name and press X. And this is gonna show me everywhere that uh, this function is being called. I'm just gonna go to the first one. Uh, and if we go up, we see that uh, EAX is passed is pushed onto the stack before the function is called, meaning that that's the first parameter. And so the name is uh, contained within EAX. And I'm just going to start moving up line by line until I figure out what the name of the file is. Um, in the line above it, we have var64 loaded into EAX. So var64 is going to contain the name of the file. Uh, and I go up a couple more lines. I see uh, var64 loaded into EAX, the uh, sim.dll uh, being pushed, and then var64 pushed onto the stack, and then uh, string cat called. So uh, var64 at this point probably has some other things in it. Um, but we know at least the name of the file that the DLL is going to be written out to is called cimm.dll. So, uh, let's see. So I have. So Alex asks, I have four cross refs to f open, two types, p and r. Any reason why? So let me jump over and see. Um. I don't know, honestly, because I only see two in my version. Um, if you're using a different version um, of Ida Pro, then it could be, oh, the same addresses, one P and uh, one R for each. Ah, okay. Um, I don't, I'm going to be honest with you, I don't recall. So uh, what Alex is talking about it here is when he does, uh, a cross ref uh, on F open. Uh, you click on F open and press X to see everywhere where it's being called. Um, he's seeing uh, four uh, versions here. Um, 
two uh two um two to, to the same addresses. So we have one with a type P and one with a type R uh, going to one address and one with a type P and one with a type R going to another. Um, I am i don't remember what type P is. Um, R I believe means relative, which just means that um, from this space, this is a relative to where the address is uh, from where you're at. Um, I don't remember what P is. Uh, I will find out though. Um, uh, David says, in the imports, there are MSV CRT, kernel 32, EdVapi 32, and the library com. It seems like the MSV CRT is code from the EXE. Are the others loaded at runtime? Um, actually, all of the, so here uh, in the import, in the imports tab, and the imports tab here is the import address table for this program. If you're not sure, if you don't know what the import address table is, the import address table is essentially the uh, table that contains all of the DLLs and all the APIs that are loaded by that program. Um, all of these are loaded when the program is run. So what happens is when the operating system loads up a program into memory, it reads the import address table, and then it loads up all those DLLs uh, into memory, and then it resolves where those APIs are uh, in memory uh, in the table. What, what, what essentially happens is the import address table, if you were actually watching it in memory, you'd see the operating system overwrite the name reg set value exa with an address in memory and then do the same thing for reg query value and, and so on. So all these are resolved at runtime. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, it's uh, MSV CRT is code from the exe. So let me. So all of these are, um, I, I don't believe uh, these are, I, I could be wrong though, but I don't believe that the MSV CRT uh, uh, functions are um, embedded within the executable themselves. Yeah, they're not, they're, they're, they're out to uh, a DLL. Um, I, so correct me if I'm wrong, David, but are, I think what you're asking is, um, if the code from MSV CRT is actually code that's embedded, uh, those functions are embedded within the, the program itself as opposed to being loaded at the DLL? Okay, okay, I, I think we're good then, yeah. So anything you see in the import table is going to be loaded at runtime. Um, now, for those of you who have ever looked at packers or have ever taken my malware analysis class where we talk about packers, there are two functions that you want to look for. Uh, and I, um, one of them is loaded now. Um, actually, both of them are loaded now. So if you ever see the function get proc address and then load library, um, these can be used to load up uh, DLLs and APIs um, as the program runs itself. So what happens, let me see if it actually loads it up here. Oh yeah, cool, awesome. So because you know Windows is Windows and because you can do a million things uh, with, um, be, because you can do a million things uh, or the same thing a million different ways, uh, what, there are API calls for pretty much everything. And because of that, um, there are ways that you can load up APIs dynamically as the program runs, as opposed to having them specified in the import address table, which is what we see here. And the way you do that is with the function called load library and get proc address. So if you ever see malware doing this, the calling load library and calling get proc address, that means that, that it's dynamically loading an API as the program runs. Uh, in this particular case, uh, we see the malware call um, load library and it, it sends the uh, uh, the parameter it's giving it is kernel 32. Um, so what it's doing right here is it's loading kernel 32 into memory uh, and then what gets returned in EAX is the, the address in memory for kernel 32. If kernel 32 is already in memory, which it will be, um, then it will uh, go ahead and just return the, the address for it. And once it has the address for, for that particular DLL in memory, then it calls get proc address on the specific function that it wants to, uh, to uh, load from 
that DLL. In this particular case, it's, it's doing a little bit of a, a, a trick here. Um, and we can see that a little bit better if I uh, change the way that we look at this. So, so here we see that um, the uh, process name and Ida Pro automatically uh, label this for us. Um, the process, uh, the API name that it uh, wants to load from kernel 32 is called FET system directory A. And I can guarantee that if you go out and Google that, you are not going to find anything that says FET system. There's no API called FET system directory A. Um, so, but we see that it's pushing the uh, procedure name into EAX and then pushing that onto the stack. And then we see that it's actually moving the, the byte G into the very first uh, byte of where EAX is pointing. Well, EAX is, contains this, the, um, uh, this FET system directory A. So what's essentially going on here is when it moves G into um, the first uh, byte of uh, EAX, it's overwriting this F right here. So this becomes get system directory A. Um, and that's just one way that the malware is tricking, I don't know, uh, maybe a signature call or something like that. Now, the cool thing is, um, we could actually see this happen. So hopefully, oh, well, this is why I'm doing it in, in a VM. Let me make sure that I'm not going to pwn myself. Uh, let's just change this. So let's say we actually wanted to see this happen uh, with our debugger. Um, all we need to do is set a breakpoint at this memory address and start setting th uh, um, stepping through. So I will go ahead and do that. So here I have antivirus loaded up. Um, just moving things around so I can see it. I want to set a breakpoint at this address here, 401020. And the easiest way to do that is I can press Control G um, and type 401020. And then that will take me to that um, particular line. Um, I'm going to set a breakpoint on that line. Um, so if all goes according to plan, I'm going to run my program and it should break when it hits this line, Lord willing. So let me hit, I'm just going to hit run. Um, if it works, it will run. And then down here, we're going to see that it said that it, it broke at that line. So let's run it. Uh, and uh, so it ran until the entry point, which is fine. This is uh, the way that it works. Um, so I'm going to run it again. And let's hope that it stops. I always get a little nervous when I'm running pro, running malware um, with breakpoints in it. And cool, it actually worked. So here you can see down here at the bottom, hopefully you guys can see this, uh, we see an N3 breakpoint at, at antivirus 401020. So this is where we set the breakpoint. So it's right here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start stepping through so that we can see that, the, uh, that this being um, overwritten. So what we're gonna see here is first that this uh, value right here is gonna be moved into uh, EAX. And I'm just hitting F8. If you recall, F8 is going to uh, take us one step at a time. So here we have uh, EAX over here that contains this memory value. And what I'm gonna do is just so we can watch it a little bit easier is I'm going to right click on this value and do follow and dump. And you can see down here in the lower left corner in the dump, we can see this uh, FET system directory A. I'm gonna expand that a little bit more. All right, so the next thing it does is it pushes EAX onto the stack. Uh, and then this is where we have uh, where it's going to um, uh, move the G into the first byte of EAX. Remember, EAX is pointing to right here, this memory value down here. So if you watch this F uh, right here, you should see it change to get system directory A. So I'm going to hit F8. And it did. Cool. So we just went through and just, you know, went through step by step just to see how, how that would work in a debugger if we weren't sure what, that, what it did. Okay. So I have gotten, I went on a huge tangent there, so I apologize. Um, Jay, moving DLL flow. I don't know what you mean by that. I'll let you uh, kind of type your explanation for that. Um, 
let me uh, jump over to the, the, the the other question that we had, uh, so we answered the one question, what is the name of the file for D the DLL resource? Um, let's try to find the name for the file for the uh, XML resource. So let's just do the same thing. We'll go back to F write. Um, we already saw one place that I was writing to, so let's, let's jump at the, to the second one and see what, what that is. So here we have F write. Remember the, um, uh, this is where it writes out. Um, here is F open, um, EAX. Uh, remember, that's going to have the first parameter passed to F open is going to be the uh, the name of it, um, and that's contained in EAX. And Ida Pro is nice enough to highlight everything for us so that we see that EAX um, is actually in var eight one oh eight. Uh, and I'm just going to scroll up until I find var 108. Uh, and here we can see that it's, um, it looks like it's, uh, we have another string cat here where var 108 is uh, being put into a file called help.txt. So we have it writing out to a file called help.txt, um, but we don't see anything here for our resource. Um, but let me write, let me just rename this. We'll call this file underscore write, oops, write help, help.txt. Um, but let's see where this comes from, where this is called from, and maybe we'll figure that out. So I'm just going to click X or press X. It's only called from one place. Ah, and here we have another resource being called here, size of resource, lock resource, load resource, and hey, here we have find resource with the name XML. So if we kind of follow the flow of code in this particular function, and I'll just call this res underscore um, XML resource, just so I know what it is. We have it loading up the XML resource. And then we have it calling where it's writing out to a file named help.txt. And if we would follow the flow of code, we would see that uh, it was writing out uh, the XML resource. So now we know the answer to the second question is uh, that the XML resource is written out to a file called help.txt. Uh, and then the last question was, what is the name of the mutex that is set? So, oops, I'm sorry. We'll go to the imports again. Um, there are a number of different functions that are used with uh, mutexes. Uh, the one you want to look for for when something is being set is called create mutex, oddly enough. So here I will just go to that, uh, click on it, and go to um, the cross-references. And fortunately, we only see one uh, mutex being set. Uh, so I click on that. And here um, we have it called. And uh, if you would go in and see that the, uh, the last uh, parameter here being pushed or being sent to the function is the name. It's called LP name. Uh, and here's the first parameter, second parameter, third parameter, and it's called helper mutex. So the name of the mutex that's being set is called helper mutex. And we found that just by searching for the create mutex function. All right. So getting back to Jay's question. Um, All right, where the standard DLL sets, was wondering if this was putting the malicious DLL elsewhere in the standard path of DLL pull, but that was before you explained stuff that would help them. Okay. Um, so I, I see what you're asking. Um, uh, I think you were asking, you know, if that's where, if it was putting in the, the malicious DLL in the path of the, uh, the standard DLL loading, uh, because the, the load order for the DLLs, um, we didn't actually went and uh, look at that. Um, I can tell you if you want to, uh, so let me, let me jump back to where, uh, the function where it's writing out the DLL. Um, uh, and then I have to jump back one function. So I'm going to leave this up to you guys if, if you want. Um, but I can tell you what's going on here is that, uh, where the name of the DLL is where it's being concatenated with this var64. This var64 is actually being set to a directory in this function here. Um, actually, I think 
this is actually the one that we just looked at. So um, what's going on here is uh, the get system directory A, um, the function that's being called, uh, th that return, get system directory returns a system directory. Uh, I believe it's C colon backslash windows. Uh, and so what's going on is uh, C colon backslash windows or C colon backslash windows backslash system 32 is being concatenated to this. So to answer your question, yes, it is actually trying to um, write out this particular DLL into the standard load order path for DLLs. Uh, good, good, uh, good catch on that. Now, um, so uh, I'll throw this out to you guys. Because it's, low, it's trying to uh, write it out to Windows or, or System32, what does that mean about this particular program? What, what, what is it going to have to be able to do in order to do that? Or better yet, do you think that this would work in a, on, a window, in a, on an operating system like Windows 7? Right, Alex got it right. You need local admin rights. Um, in order to write into Windows or to, in order to write into System32, you need local admin rights or you need to be able to um, escalate your privileges through user access, uh, uh, user access control or, or um, some exploit in order to write into System or System32. Um, Antivirus.exe, this particular malware, if I remember right, this was actually written in the Windows XP days when anybody could write into the system directories, which is why it automatically tries to do that. But, okay. So, let me jump back to the slides really fast. So we just answered these three questions um, just by doing a quick reverse engineering of the, the malware uh, just to answer these particular questions. We wanted to know what files were being written to and what the name of the mutex that was set. And somebody had mentioned this in chat. Yes, you could go in and just figure this out through strings analysis. And in fact, you know, strings analysis is often the first thing that malware uh, analysts do. You know, they, they dump strings while they're waiting for the malware to run or, or something like that. And you get a lot of this information through strings, um, through strings analysis. However, where reverse engineering comes into play is what if those strings are obfuscated or encrypted through some way that you cannot easily figure out? That's when you need to jump in to do um, reverse engineering in order to see exactly what it's doing. Remember that malware analysis is seeing what uh, malware is doing. Reverse engineering is seeing how it does it. Okay. Uh, and Jay is absolutely right. A great way to jumpstart CTFs is through strings. Um, strings is probably the number one tool for any type of analysis. And you can almost guarantee that any level one for uh, some, a CTF, you can probably break it through strings. In fact, I think even uh, Flare, the, the, the Flare reverse engineering challenge, level one you could get through just by doing strings. Um, Right, exactly. And so David says, you know, strings calls it FET system directory A. And that's exactly why the malware is probably uh, doing that, that character uh, rename um, is to get around strings analysis. Because if you did strings, uh, if you had some type of signature or static signature that was looking for get system directory A, it would miss it in this case. Or, you know, you would see FET system directory, you would never see the, the G being moved over to it uh, just by looking at strings analysis. But, okay. So that was just by looking at, at system calls. Um, and again, you know, I'm going on, to the, <clears throat> on the assumption that a lot of you don't have uh, a lot of reverse engineering experience, but just you know, from doing what you just did, uh, being able to go in and just jumping around and looking at the different imports and the functions that are being called, you were able to figure out some, some pretty valuable information. Um, mutex is, the file names, if you would have run the malware, you probably would have seen, but the mutex you may not have seen. You, you, uh, you would probably have to have some uh, special uh, analysis software in order to find that, but you were able to find it very quickly just by doing reverse engineering. But but let's move on. Let me make sure that one last time that there are no questions, but I think we're good. Cool. So let's move on to malware encryption. 
So malware is going to use encryption a lot. And, and you'll see this, I'm going to be honest, I, I can't think of any malware sample that hasn't had some type of encryption uh, inside of it um, at some point um, in the last couple of years. They're going to use it to either encode their network traffic or encode their internal strings, or they're going to use it to, uh, like ransomware does, to, to encrypt files, or, or there are just so many ways or reasons why malware would use encryption. Um, but there are you can kind of boil down a lot of the encryption that malware uses into um, about three different categories. The first is XOR encryption. Um, XOR is a mathematical operation. We're going to talk a lot about XOR here in a, in a little bit, but XOR is very uh, fast to, to use. Uh, it, it's a very commonly used and it's commonly used because it's so fast. And the way that you find XOR encryption is you look for loops that contain XOR instructions. Um, and, and we'll get into this a little bit uh, more uh, in a couple minutes. I, I don't want to go too far into it because there are a lot of little tricks and caveats to look for XOR encryption. Uh, in addition to that, there's also Base64 encoding. And Base64 is really encoding, it's not encryption, but you'll see a lot of that within uh, malware uh, nowadays. Um, <clears throat> the best way to figure out if you're looking at Base64 encoding is uh, really, uh, honestly, strings analysis. Um, look for the base 64 alphabet. Uh, the base 64 alphabet are the uppercase characters, the, followed by the lowercase characters, followed by the digits zero through nine, and then plus and forward slash. If you see any of those as one large string, then you're dealing with base 64. Um, or the malware probably has the uh, ability to do base 64 uh, encoding or decoding. Uh, now, if you have a string or a piece of data uh, that you, uh, that you're not sure how it's encoded, you can tell it, you can always tell if it's encoded with base 64 if, first off, if it ends with either one or two equal signs because base 64 strings or pieces that are encoded by base 64 have to uh, be uh, in a length that's a multiple of four. And if it's not in a length that's in a multiple of four, then it's padded with one or two equal signs. Um, that's one way you can tell if you're dealing with base 64 encoded data. Another way is when you look at the data, if all you see are the values in the base 64 alphabet, then you're probably dealing with base 64 encoding. Uh, and then finally, you uh, have all of the different um, types of encryption that are out there. There's RC4, there's AES, there's uh, Camilla, there's just tons and tons of different encryption standards that are out there. Um, that malware will use, especially ransomware. Ransomware is really where you start to get into the different types of encryption uh, that's being used. Um, the ways that you can determine that this is being used is uh, first look for encryption constants. Um, there are lots of different uh, numerical constants that are used with various uh, different encryption algorithms, and there are plugins that will allow you to uh, find these within a program, and we'll talk about those in a second. Um, another way to, to look for this is look for the Microsoft Crypto APIs being loaded in the import address table uh, of your malware or that are being dynamically loaded. Most of the crypto APIs are in advapi32.dll, and these are the ones that are called crypt decrypt or crypt encrypt. Um, there's also crypt hash create or, or something like that. They all tend to begin with the word crypt. So somebody had asked previously, you know, how do we deal with something like AES encryption? Um, how, do, how do we figure that out? Well, the way that I would go through and do that is uh, if you were dealing with a piece of malware that was uh, using something like AES encryption, that means it's using some type of key to encrypt the data, right? So what you do is you look for the encryption call um, within the, the program, within the malware, and you look for the value uh, of the key. And you basically just start tracing back until you find where that, cre that key is created. Now, if you're lucky, that key is uh, hard-coded within, um, within the malware, and then that means that you may be able to break it. Um, if, if it's public-private key, if the uh, private key is not in there, then you're kind of out of luck. Um, but you, you never know, you, you may get lucky. Um, a lot of times what I've seen is uh, with something like RC4 or, or even AES, what happens is, um, oh, I'm trying to think, uh, I, I may be getting this wrong. 
Um, but a lot of times what I've seen is the malware will um, hash a static value. So it'll create like an MD5 hash of a static value and then use that static value as the key for the encryption. So if it's doing like RC4 or, or AES type encryption, um, like I said, just start tracing back and hopefully you'll find the um, where the key is being created and uh, to be able to break it uh, based off of that. Uh, you, you'll, you're going to be surprised that at how often um, malware will have some type of strong encryption like AES or RC4 in there, but has a very weak key that you can break it very easily. All right. So, oh, oops, sorry about that. So let me just make sure that So I think we're, we're all still good. Cool. All right, so all these different ways that I, that I talk about here are kind of cumbersome to do on your own or do manually. Um, and so you wanna automate that as much as you, as, as much as you can. Um, Ida Pro has some really great plugins to do this. I already mentioned IdaScope. Um, IdaScope does so many cool things um, Daniel Plowman is uh, the gentleman who created it. Um, I highly recommend you follow him on Twitter or, or anywhere else. Um, he is absolutely brilliant and this is one of my absolute favorite plugins. And one of the things that it can do is it will scan your code for uh, compression and uh, com uh, encryption uh, signatures or, or constant values and tell you where those are. So those can give you ideas if, let's say you find the uh, an encryption uh, value for AES uh, in your program, then that means that, that it could be doing AES encryption. Um, if you see ones for MD5 or Zlib, then you, then you have an idea of what it's uh, using within that. Um, IdaScope is one, excuse me, there's another one called FindCrypt and FindCrypt2. Uh, I think FindCrypt2 just kind of enhances FindCrypt. Um, that will go in your program and look for some of the encryption constants as well. So you can see what type of encryption you're, you're, you're dealing with. Unfortunately, like I said before, you cannot use these in IDA Pro free. Um, I really looked hard to try to find a plugin that you could use in the free version of IDA Pro to do this and I was not able to. However, one of the things that I found is uh, that in FindCrypt 2, uh, which is the IDA Pro, IDA Pro plugin, and actually I uh, uploaded it to our Google Drive, so you can go in there and, and look at it. It actually contains the source code uh, for the plugin. And if you go into the source code, you can actually see all the constants that it looks for. So you have this very nice resource that you can either write your own plugin uh, or script to look for these constants or just do some type of uh, find for these constants to look for uh, within, um, within your malware to see if it's using that type of encryption. <clears throat> Um, fortunately, though, X64 Debug has a plugin that's free that works to find uh, some of this. So there's a plugin called Swiss Army Knife, um, where when you load, when you install a plugin, and I'll show you how to do that in a second because installing plugins for X64 Debug is a little bit tricky. Um, you can go in, uh, you uh, load up your program, then you go to plugins with Army Knife to the crypto menu, and then do find crypt or AES finder, and it will scan for for any of those crypto constants within your within your program. Uh, you have to look at the log window to see the results. It doesn't pop them up for you, um, but it's uh, it's better than nothing. Um, so let me show you really fast. When you install plugins into X64 Debug. What you have to do is you first have to find where uh, the directory where you installed x64 debug. In my case, I installed it into C colon backslash tools, backslash x64 debug, um, the release directory. And then within there, you're going to have two directories. One is called x32 and one is called x64. Um, these are where you're going to place the plugins for uh, both x32 debug and x64 debug. And all you do is go into that directory and you'll copy the, uh, the file in. Um, oh, I'm sorry, so X32 and then underneath that will be the plugins directory. And so that's where you'll copy it in. Uh, and you will do the same thing for X64 and plugins and copy it in there. As you can see, I don't have it in here. Um, let me see if I was smart enough to, 
copy it over. I'll just do that really fast. Um, the one thing that I thought I did, but here, uh, tools. All right, so here I've got Swiss Army knife. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to the X32 directory to plugins. And here at X32 plugins is Swiss Army knife.dp32. Just going to copy that in there. And then I'll do the same thing for X64. Then I'll copy the file out of uh, Swiss Army knife. And I copy them over. Here I've got it over here. You can see that it's not loaded, but when I restart, let me restart antivirus in X32. You can see that now Swiss Army Knife is there. Um, and then I can go to crypto and then I'll just do find crypt. And then down here at the bottom, it said found zero possible instructions and zero possible arrays. So it didn't find anything. Uh, let me just try it with the AES finder and found nothing, unfortunately. So in this case, antivirus.exe does not have any AES or uh, other encryption in there. Um, but other programs might. Okay. Just glancing at what you guys are saying, just to make sure I didn't miss any questions. Cool. So like I said, uh, Swiss Army Knife is a nice program or plugin for X64 debug that's going to allow you to see the different, um, uh, some of the crypto signatures. So let's start talking about XOR uh, obfuscation. I know we're coming close to the end of the, the session here. Um, so I'm gonna go through this uh, a little bit quickly and then, but I just, uh, we should have time to get to the end and, um, kind of assign you guys uh, some homework if you want it. Uh, but single byte XOR obfuscation is uh, what you see here. Uh, this is kind of pseudocode. You have a key and then a string or a piece of data and you basically XOR in a loop the key against every byte of that string and the value that comes out is the XOR obfuscated code or XOR encrypted code, whatever you want to call it. Um, and here's what it looks like in uh, assembly. You can see here that we're dealing with a for loop. Um, this is the same loop that what we have here. Um, and if you remember when we talked about uh, loops before, this is kind of what the structure of a for loop looks like. We have the initialization up here on top. We have the, um, the, some, some code and then the, the check right here, then the body of the loop, then the increment uh, up here. So uh, I've kind of mapped this out for you. Here's where we initialize the XOR key. Uh, in this particular case, it's in var C, or it's in the variable uh, called var C. Uh, we initialize the loop iterator. We have the loop check down here with this compare. This is to make it, seeing if we're um, at the end of our loop or not. Um, here we have a, uh, we're moving a byte to uh, obfuscate into EDX. Then we XOR the byte with our key. Remember our key is in var C. Um, then we copy the XOR byte to a new array, increment our loop operator, and then jump back up to the very beginning of the loop. Now, I mentioned before that uh, one of the things that you're gonna wanna look for are loops that have XOR in it because that's a very good indication that you're dealing with an XOR loop. Um, now, you may not, uh, you may or may not recall this from last week, but XOR is actually used in a lot of different places in programs. Um, you'll often see XOR or value being XOR against itself because that's a very quick way to uh, set a value to zero. So if you ever see something like XOR EAX comma EAX, that, that doesn't mean that EAX is being XOR twice or encrypted twice. It just means that EAX is being cleared out to being set to zero because it's much faster to XOR a value against itself than to move zero into EAX or subtract EAX by itself uh, and so on. Um, what you want to look for are loops where you have an e, uh, a XOR value where the two two different values are being XORed together. So in this particular case where we see the two bytes being XORed, we have uh, uh, var C being XORed against EDX. Uh, 
This doesn't always mean that you're dealing with encryption, uh, but when you see it in a loop like this, typically means that yes, you are actually dealing with uh, some type of XOR encryption. So that's what you wanna look for. But this is a single byte uh, XOR loop. What, the, what I mean by that is, let me jump back up to the pseudocode, is that our key is only one byte long. Um, so it's a very, very simple loop. Now, of course, now our authors are going to be a bit more tricky than that. And so they're going to use multi-byte XOR keys. Um, the the multi-byte XOR keys means that there's more key combinations that are possible, which means that you can't just brute force this. With single, uh, with single byte uh, XOR uh, encoding, you can brute force it fairly easily. In fact, um, if you've never used the tool XOR search, uh, I highly recommend checking it out uh, by Didier Stevens. Uh, it basically brute forces all single byte XOR keys and is really great actually to find um, XOR encoded uh, data, uh, single byte XOR encoded data. But once you start getting into multi byte XOR keys, it becomes much more difficult to uh, XOR. Um, and this is just kind of what the, uh, the source code looks like. You have a key here that's multi byte, um, then you have your data. Uh, then you actually have two different types of, or two different iterators that are being done. Um, the first one, uh, in this particular case, I is going to loop through our data. So in this case, it's going to loop through hello world. And then we have J, uh, which is going to loop through our key. And then what happens is uh, you have two different incrementers for the loops. You have the one for the, the normal loop here where that's going through um, our data. In this particular case, uh, the data called string. And then you have one that's going through uh, our key. And then it, uh, it will always cycle back to the beginning of uh, our key when it hits the end. So what I mean by that is <clears throat> here we have the string hello world. Um, the first time through the loop, uh, H is going to be XORed with the byte DE. E will be XORed with AD. The first L will be XORed with BE. The second L will be XORed with EF. And then since we've hit the end of the key, we loop all the way back to the beginning. So O is XORed with DE, the space with AD, W, BE, and so on until we get to the end of our data. Um, and this is what it looks like in um, uh, in uh, assembler. Uh, again, we're dealing with a very large for loop here. It's, I had kind of had a shrug things a little bit. It's kind of hard to see it. Um, but this is just one big for loop that's going through and, and doing that and doing the, uh, the multi byte XOR key. Um, at the very top, we have the initialization of the I loop iterator. Uh, we have our loop check. Um, the J iterator is initialized uh, at the very top somewhere. It's, it's off the screen. Um, here we have, we're moving a byte over into EDX. We're moving uh, the, a byte of the key into ECX. We XOR the two together. Then we uh, copy XOR byte into the new array. And, and then we increment the, the J uh, loop variable in that whole section right there. And then we increment the I loop uh, iterator. Um, I did go through and rename some of the variables uh, in Ida Pro in this particular case, just to make it a little bit easier for you. Um, so, with this, um, you may want to actually go through and, and analyze these on your own. So, there are, there is a, um, <coughs> excuse me, in, let me, let me pull it up here, uh, in uh, the class drive, under examples, you have a file called xor.exe, and this has both uh, xor loops that we just looked at uh, within there. <clears throat> um, that you can go in and look at on your own. Now, the one thing that I, I do want to show you guys really quickly. Um, do, let me jump back here. Do I have XOR in here? No, let me, give me one second. Let me copy XOR in. If I can find it. So here we've got uh, XOR. I'm just gonna load it up into Ida Pro. Now, um, you're gonna see a lot of functions being uh, called here uh, and a lot of code being called here. And all of this code that you're seeing here, um, or I'd say 99% of this code that you're seeing right here is actually from Visual C++ putting in all of these security and memory checks. 
Uh, it has absolutely nothing to do with our code. And so we, and because I didn't want you to have to dig through every single one of these to find the example code to look through, if you go over to the strings window, you're gonna see two strings, one that says single byte XOR and one that says multi byte XOR. Um, if you do a cross reference on let's say single byte XOR, you'll find the function that's doing the single byte XOR. Um, and same thing, if you go back to the strings and do the same thing for the multi byte XOR string, you'll find the function that's doing the multi byte XOR. I just did that just so it's a little bit easier for you uh, to find uh, when you're looking, if you want to look at the examples. <clears throat> uh, so there's one question, is it possible for them to use XOR encryption without XOR call stack instruction? Um, so is it possible to do XOR encryption without the XOR uh, instruction? Yeah, I'm going to say yes, it is actually possible. Um, I believe, so I will have to research this, um, but I believe it is actually possible to get the same result of XOR and two bytes together by doing a number of different ands and ors to it. Um, I have seen it done in the past, although it's not very common. I'm going to have to look to see how, um, how that's possible, but Jay, to answer your question, it is actually possible to do XOR without using the XOR instruction. Um, that's a good question. Uh, let me write that down. I will see if I can find that. Okay. So we are basically at the end of the session. Let's just do one quick thing um, and then uh, we'll kind of get to the homework and then any final questions. Uh, and then um, one other thing, uh, possibly. Um, oops. So, you know, the second exercise was, you know, back to antivirus.exe. You know, DLL, the DLL resource uh, is being decrypted somehow. How is it being decrypted? Or even better, can we write some type of program to decrypt it? So let's just jump back into IDA Pro really fast for antivirus. Um, and let's go to here. I'm just jumping back to the function that we saw where it was writing DLL out. Because if you remember, we have this loop right here. And all of the, uh, if we were to trace all the code previous to this loop, we would see that it was loading up the resource and then it was loading the resource into a, um, a value, into a, a one of, a, probably a var four here is where it's loading it up into. Um, and then if we look at this, we can see that we have an XOR uh, instruction. It's XORing AL uh, by DL. Um, and we know that it's XORing it by uh, bytes uh, as opposed to words because it's using AL and DL as opposed to uh, EAX and EDX. Um, and it's within a loop. And we know it's within a loop because we have this little um, thing right here uh, that, that jumps up. We have a jump uh, below. Um, a compare here where it's comparing EDI to this var eight um, and it's incrementing EDI. So my guess is that var eight is some type of um, iterator or, or uh, based on the size of the resource and so on. But um, our goal here would be to start walking through this code and figure out exactly what it was doing in, uh, in order to figure out, you know, how it was decoding um, the DLL resource. Um, I actually have this written up and because we're kind of out of time, um, I don't wanna to spend too much uh, time on it, but I will uh, I will, we'll do two things. I will let you guys kind of work on this um, over the week if you want. And as always, I'll answer any questions for you, but I'll also upload the answer on how you can figure this out up to the, um, uh, up to the uh, Google Drive if I haven't already. So you can go in and see how it's done. Um, so based on that and everything that we, uh, we uh, talked about, um, does anybody have any questions before we get to the, um, the end uh, where I kind of talk about you know, one other thing? Um, I'm not seeing any. Cool. 
So, um, kind of have a, just to try to motivate everybody a little bit more, um, I'm gonna do something a little bit differently. So here we have this homework. If you go to the Google Drive, you're gonna find a file called ransomware. Actually, let me just pull it up. So if you go to the drive under the homework directory under class two, you have two files. One is called ransomware.zip and the other is called importantfile.txt.txt. Um, I'm not going to open up, actually I'll try to open up important file. And you can see important file is just, you know, all of this kind of gobbledygook. Ransomware.zip, this, uh, this actually does contain ransomware. Again, we're dealing with real malware here. Um, so this is what's happened. Um, the, ran the ransomware here uh, encrypted this important file. Um, for the homework for this week, I want you to figure out how to decrypt the file by reverse engineering the ransomware. It is absolutely uh, possible for you to do this given everything that we talked about tonight and that we talked about in the last session. And to make it just a little bit more interesting, let me see if I can pull up. Oh, come on. So there is a really cool uh, program or game out there called TIS-100. Um, this is a program or this is a game which basically uses assembler in order to get through the different levels. You, you're literally writing assembler programs as this game. The first person to send me the correct uh, decoding of that file, I will buy this game for you and send it to you on Steam. Um, obviously, you need to be on Steam in order to uh, receive this, um, but the first person I get the answer from, I will send this to. That looks awesome. Cool. Just, you know, a little bit more uh, motivation, I, I guess. Um, so with that, uh, does anybody have any questions or anything else that, uh, they would like to talk about or, um, either that we talked about tonight or that we, um, talked about in the previous session? <clears throat> cool. I'm, I'm not seeing, uh, much going on. Um, I, I will show that, uh, in a second, uh, Jeremiah. Um, I don't think people can see my chat. Hopefully not. Um, cool. So with that, um, before we stop the video, uh, I just want to say thank you everybody again. Um, if you have any questions, you know, hit me up on the, uh, the BreakSec uh, Slack channel in the malware channel or privately or send me an email or hit me up on Twitter or, or anything like that. And I will absolutely, you know, answer any questions you have outside of giving you the answer to this uh, for, for the moment. Um, but with that, uh, thank you everybody. And I, I guess I will talk to you uh, next week. Excellent. All right. Well, uh, yeah. Thank you, uh, Tyler. That was uh, that was a supersized episode. That was almost what two hours or so. Yeah, yep. But that's cool. I, I learned a whole lot. I'm gonna have to go back through and and watch this again because I missed like ten minutes of it with my smoked turkey. So. <laughs> Um, so yeah, that was it for this, uh, this episode. If, uh, you have any questions, please feel free to hit up, uh, hit us up on our Slack, uh, breaksec.signup.team, or you can send out a, a DM to at breaksec on Twitter, um, and we'll add you to the invite and, um, please feel free to check out our podcast. If you're listening to this online in the future, um, you know, breakingsecurity.com or, um, uh, we're on Twitter at breaksec, B-R-A-K-E-S-E-C. All right, that was it for this week. Thank you.